I realized, uh, starting about halfway through the morning, that I was getting this little flutter in my stomach, which for me is kind of unusual. I mean, as a conductor, I don't usually get nervous or anything, but uh, I attribute this to the fact that um, uh, this must be meaningful to me, and that I'm, I'm uh, genuinely privileged and feel humbled to be amongst my distinguished colleagues um, here this, this week. So I'm going to blame my teachers. <laughs> I'm going to blame my teachers for giving me the curiosity to tackle a subject such as Latin American rhythms. And I'm going to blame my teachers more for giving me the courage to do this publicly. <laughs> so it's, it's really a great pleasure to be uh, again in Fargo, North Dakota. I, I taught for a couple of years at Vermilion, South Dakota, so I'm familiar somewhat with the territory. But the last time I was in Fargo, I was here just before Christmas in 1986 during a snowstorm, and it was very cold. And I was on a national tour with the Roger Wagner Chorale. In fact, on that same tour, we sang in St. Paul, Minnesota, where Dale Warland was in the audience. And I saw him backstage after the concert, and I mentioned this to him yesterday. It was, uh, it was a fond memory. But I'm reminded that the storm made it very difficult to make our flight out. And Roger Wagner needed to get back to Los Angeles for a Messiah sing-along concert that night. So he was running from airline counter to airline counter, getting louder and louder, declaring, do you know who I am? <laughs> and requesting any flight out that he could possibly get. And so if any of you have known Roger Wagner, uh, you'll know what I mean, but you really had to be there. <laughs> so this image of cold and some of the, the climate that we've experienced the last couple of days, cool for this time of year here in North Dakota, is really in direct opposition to the topic today, Latin American rhythm. Because the first line that I wrote in my recent book on rhythms is that Latin rhythm is hot. It is exotic and it is emotional. So here we are in North Dakota using our imagination to conjure up a climate that is extremely warm, humid, sunny, mixed with rain, and a people who prioritize eternal fun and excitement, fun and enjoyment, singing, dancing, playing instruments, partying with friends is a regular scheduled way of life, not an occasional exception to the routine. So the reason that I tackled this subject is very straightforward. My first visit to Central America was September 1986, and since that time I have been to Costa Rica on more than 40 occasions, as well as Panama, Guatemala, and Chile. And each of these early trips filled my ears with Latin music. However, I did not identify the differences between the rhythms. I just couldn't parse it out. When I performed a Latin piece, I followed the printed notation, but that did not come close to capturing the feel that I heard in native performances. So I began the process to better understand the subject. What I discovered, curious enough, is that the performance practice of Latin American rhythm runs very parallel in its nature to the study of other practices that I had studied and even written about, for example, Gregorian semiology, English madrigals, or 19th century romantic rubato. For each style, there is a requisite set of essentials to the essence. Those elements that must be there in order for each music to reflect its style. And we simply have to know them. In Latin rhythm, there are three contributing factors that define a recipe for each rhythm. 
In addition, there is adequate flexibility in the selection of alternative instruments for each of these rhythms. The three principal influences that comprise the recipe, that fusion of the same organic influences that make up the Latin Americas themselves are Europe, Africa, and the indigenous. We've heard that several times now over the last couple of days. From Europe is generally the influence of Spain, which contributed classical forms and meters to the rhythm. The European influence on Latin American rhythm began with the colonization of the New World by Spain and Portugal in the 15th and 16th century. However, 500 years earlier, the Moors of Arabia occupied the Iberian Peninsula, the southwestern tip of Europe, that includes the countries of Andorra, Portugal, Spain, and the British crown colony of Gibraltar. The nearest point, it is only five miles from the continent of Africa, across the Strait of Gibraltar. So what Spain brought to the New World was itself an amalgamation of influences. Beginning in the second millennium, Spain was a melting pot of cultures. In this pot was a combination of European, Arabic, Gypsy, Nordic, Indian and Judaic influences. One result of such ascendancy is that subcontinental music in the Latin Americas, also known as musica campesina, or music of the countryside, is embedded with this Spanish character. There are additional compelling influences. The gypsy imprint of northern India was characteristically nomadic as was the North African Arabic culture. Troubadours from France in the 12th and 13th century introduced their song forms in Europe. And by the 16th century, the troubadours of Castile were singing in an octosyllabic decima style, the 10 poetic lines of eight syllables that were developed by a mixed culture of Spaniards and Arabs during the occupation of the Moors. The decima form, survives in the Latin ballad known as Bolero, the Mexican Coril, the Colombian uh, Vallenato, the Puerto Rican Decima or Seis, the Cuban Trova, and even the folk songs of Argentine Nueva Canción. Iberian culture was a complex network engendered by the Moorish occupation, and when it came into contact with the influence of, uh, influences of the Third World, a hybrid form emerged. At the center of Afrocentric development was the slave trade route that originated from various regions of Africa and led to the Caribbean island of Cuba. Along the way, the various African cultures gave birth to many musical genres, such as merengue, cumbia, samba, and mapale. But all roads lead to Cuba. The principal music traditions that survived the transplant from Africa to the New World include call and response singing, polymeter, polyrhythms, pentatonic and non-Western scales, and the development and creation of numerous instruments, both percussive and melodic. But at the core of African rhythm is its drumming, which is partly a form of communication, calling upon a set of West African saints, the Orishas to come down to earth during sacred ceremonies. Many of the slaves brought to Cuba were from the tradition of Yoruban, Yoruban ethnic practices and were followers of the Orishas. The African bell pattern, the essence of clave, call and response, multiple rhythms performed simultaneously, as in polyrhythm, and an overarching priority given to rhythm and melody are only a few of the principal contributions to, of Africa to music of the Latin Americas. Indigenous peoples inhabited most all regions prior to colonization. Curiously, vocal music was rarely performed, and practicing one's music alone was even less common. 
The purpose of making music in this vast territory was for communal solidarity. The quality of music was judged not on the refinement of sound, but on the experience and social relations engendered. Within this practice, anyone can join in, and no one comments on how good or bad you are. So to repeat, from the unfolding of three principal influences, Europe, the African diaspora, and indigenous, has developed a palette of rhythms, each rhythm associated strongly with its geographic point, and each being distinctive in its structure and or beat. The acumen of each rhythm is a combination of both cadence, accentuation, and instrumental color. Consequently, a given rhythm is conventional at its geographical birth in both metric field and timbre. To each individual rhythm, there is a skeletal rhythmic cell upon which a song is composed. How this cell is fleshed out is largely left upon its inspiration. The recipe is also an indication of the instruments appropriate to each rhythm. European instruments include strings, be like violins, guitars, wind instruments, and brass instruments, largely from military influence, keyboards, organ, accordion, and later piano, and percussion. Castanets, panderet, kind of tambourine with jingles. African instruments included primarily drums, bells, and shakers in all forms and configuration. Wind instruments like panpipes and flutes and drums became the principal instruments of indigenous people. As with myself, there are many choral conductors who love Latin American music, but who feel challenged by rhythmic issues. For me, my solution for myself was to write a treatise that would help me to understand these rhythms and to perform the music responsibly. The good news is that these rhythms are actually very accessible, very accessible. And with some practice, we can all capture the basics. The particular book, Performance of Latin American Rhythms, uh, is organized in two parts. First, I offer some detailed writing on the background and principles of Latin American music. And second, I provide analyses of specific rhythms, including embedded audio tracks for each rhythm. Over 100, about 120 audio tracks, played and recorded by a master percussionist Robert Fernandez, a specialist in Latin American music, someone who travels the world every summer, uh, gathering more and more information, uh, places in Africa, places in South America, um, Brazil, uh, and he's always in Cuba in the summer. These tracks realize first the basic skeletal rhythmic cell for each rhythm, as well as second, any essential individual parts played on the correct instruments. Third, any possible accompaniment lines played on the correct instruments. And finally, an ensemble performance, if appropriate. Not all of the rhythms are actually designed as an ensemble type of sound. They're just some influenced by individual lines, and there are various options and choices one can make for those. Additionally, substitute instrumental possibilities are recommended in case original instruments are not available. The book was reviewed by numerous authorities in the field of Latin American music, and the audio examples provide a clear path to a successful performance. It is my sincere intention that the book will contribute to increased performances of this wonderful, wonderful body of literature, and especially to enhance the comfort level of my colleagues with the rhythms. So this is the uh, formal, I think you have the, you may have the 
the uh, slides already in your possession. I sent them. I don't know if you have them. But this is the formal um, citation for, for the book, published by Gentry Publications. The substitute instruments are generally the ones that we have in most instrumental music programs. Congas, bongos, djembes, claves, merengue, maracas, egg shakers, cowbells, and wiros or wiras. These can take the place of more authentic instruments with their exotic names like bombo de guerra, shekere, pandeiro, or surdo. And I think the element that this element, this particular substitution offering uh, in the book, is, is probably one of its most useful characteristics. About three years ago, I had the pleasure of working as a colleague with Christian Grasas. And we talked together for one year before he moved to his current position at the University of Southern California. For the past couple of years, I've enjoyed Christian's two very successful ACDA workshops on the topic of Latin rhythms at the Western Division Convention in Reno, Nevada and the recent National Convention in Dallas. Uh, tomorrow, Dr. Grasses will be presenting a session tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. on another uh, very exciting uh, topic, the music of Latin American colonial period. And so since Christian wrote the foreword to my book, I feel delighted to invite him to speak for a few minutes on this topic of rhythms. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. I think, I think uh, Bill's um, uh, publication is really very useful, and I encourage everybody to um, take a look at it. Um, but I wanted to use this time to um, to bring some ideas, um, and, and the first one that I'd like to talk about is the um, the idea that many people have that rhythm is something that you are born with or not. <laughs> and it's on the second one that I want to focus. Because a lot of people that have different origins from cultures that are not rhythmic oriented always say, I'm sorry, but I don't think I have rhythm. Um, rhythm is not my thing. Uh, please, let's not do that, because I don't think I can manage the rhythm. I think this is something that I'd like you to think about. Because Truly, rhythm is inside of us. Um, everybody has the same capabilities of understanding rhythm. We might not have the exposure that some of us had at the very beginning. Um, you might not have uh, the luck, luck of uh, being born in a culture that is... Um, dominated by dance and movement, that doesn't mean that you can't handle rhythm. So I'd like you to stop thinking about uh, rhythm as a, an unattainable uh, musical element. You have it inside of you, you have, you have a heart that's beating all the time. Everybody has a particular rhythm, uh, and you can see that when people walk, if you observe people. Actually, you could see somebody very far away and say, oh, uh, there's my dad coming. How do you know? Well, I recognize that walk, okay? Everybody has a way of um, uh, going about their day, a biorhythm. So rhythm is really within. The first thing that we have to do, though, is to stop fearing rhythm. Um, in this case, obviously, I'm taking the, the subject of Latin American rhythm to the extreme of saying everybody has some kind of a connection, natural connection to the distribution of sounds in time. We do it all the time, even when talking. So it's just a matter of reconnecting with that and uh, not allowing yourself to be blocked. I believe that uh, it is a personal um, choice. To, to not go forward and understand that it's actually something very natural. By the way, some, some cultures have the same issue 
but on other areas of music. And they say, well, really, we, we, we can tune, but hey, we have a lot of rhythm. Wait, wait, we can tune too, right? Because we speak with pitch, so we can connect with those natural things. So that's the first reflection I'd like to bring uh, here. Because we are all based on rhythmic elements as human beings, when humans get together, well, there's also a collective rhythm. Um, naturally, there's some tradition happening, there's some culture, there's some history behind it. Whatever the reason is, when groups of humans get together, there is some preference for some rhythms or others. Um, if you associate that with a region or geography, then you start having particular patterns, rhythmic patterns that are favored in one area or another. And we, you, we can easily label that as a dance, or a rhythm, or a genre. However you want to call it, it doesn't matter. What, what matters is that we understand that it is a byproduct of the union of a lot of people that have rhythms in common. So one thing that I want to think about is, it is a product of a human activity, and the second thing that I want, want you to think about is that we must recognize that is different from one region to another. It's not just to say a waltz is not a polka. We understand that these two are different. But there are some intricacies here. And the intricacies, especially in Latin America, is that these dances or these patterns that are favored are also timbre-oriented are timbre-oriented because they're associated with instruments. So you can't use the same group of instruments to play one pattern or another. You can't just do a big stamp and say, this one size fits, fits all. We have to understand the regional implications a little bit deeper. Once again, this is a very good first step for many of us to understand how these rhythms are different. That's the second reflection that I'd like to bring. And the third one, very shortly, is that the, the idea that I want you to think about is that it doesn't matter that you don't know the rhythm or that you are not in the presence of somebody that's professionally trained to play the rhythm. You can also access that rhythm somehow. It's just a matter of understanding it, okay? So once again, as in the first reflection, I bring to you a personal limitation. You are limiting yourself by saying, I don't know how to play that. I don't know anybody that can play that. Thus, this is a block of repertoire that I cannot access. That's your limitation. Just by understanding the cell, the rhythmic cell of each one of these dances, you can immediately access all the repertoire. The repertoire is there for you guys. So the reflection essentially is, don't limit yourself because you think that you are not trained to understand these rhythms. These rhythms are really much more accessible than, than what you think. We just need to understand that cell that Bill was talking about. And once we understand the cell, and also understand that we can substitute some instruments to bring out this cell, and uh, use it as a platform for uh, whatever repertoire we're performing, we are right there in the presence of the regional essence of that repertoire. So, now that we're going forward to uh, looking a little bit at the content of, of uh, your publication, uh, do it with, with fresh ears, with, um, with a renewed sense of uh, understanding, and um, with, uh, I want to say, optimism. If you can understand that optimism is just, yes, I can do it, let me just try it. Okay? Uh, there's always a lot of us that can help you in the way, and uh, we are your resources as much as you are our resources in many other things. Uh, by all means, reach out. Reach out to all of us, and we will be very happy to, to help you get started. But, 
but feel uh, hopeful that this is not just a trap. This is not a trap. This is, this is something uh, very accessible for everybody in every culture. It doesn't matter what your traditions are. Yeah? This is what I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, we'll now look at three rhythms, and I'll uh, use the publication to, uh, to sort of guide us through this. Um, we'll look at a calypso, we'll look at a mapale, and we'll look at a merengue. And we'll look, the, the, uh, the writing, my writing shows uh, a short analysis of historical background and some information about each. We'll look at this analysis, we'll look at the, uh, the embedded uh, audio, get a sense of each rhythm, and then listen to a performance. And each performance, uh, for each performance, the choir is El Café Coral from Costa Rica, and its director is David Ramirez, who will be part of the International Choral Summit Call tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., uh, which is moderated by Tim Sharp. So let me get out of this. I believe we do have these scores in your binder. Yes, we have these scores. Friday. Um, Under Friday's tab. Yeah. So, <coughs> so has a history. Read about the history. Um, it has a skeleton. And the skeleton has this inflection and this pattern. possibilities that could be used. If you're, adding, if you're adding instruments to this, you don't have to add instruments to this music. It can be implicit within your voice. Once you understand the inflection, it informs the singing itself. But if you're going to um, accompany uh, the calypso, you can use uh, this same cell. example that we'll hear in this style is Café Coral performing a calypso from the eastern side of Costa Rica. We performed it yesterday with the chamber singers, if you were here in the morning, uh, the, the, the uh, Congori Shango, which is based upon a story about the Orishas and um, uh, very, very much African influence. So the uh, performance of this piece that uses that, influenced by that inflection and pattern, uh, is this performance. Mira la 
So, the Mapile is a Colombian dance <coughs> originating in Guinea and flourishing in the Colombian coast in the early 17th century. <coughs> and you can see that there are two forms of the Mapile, one in 6-8 and one in the 4-4. The one that we are listening to in this particular choral arrangement, this song, is in the duple, in the 4-4. So, um, the the, the, skel, the, the skeleton cell of this rhythm and the traditional mapale instruments uh, are a mapale drum, not everybody owns one, <coughs> shakers, and kata. But the practical substitutes for these original instruments, as provided by Bob Fernandez, are congas, uh, this particular uh, rubano by Remo uh, drum makers, maracas, woodblock, floor tom. The rhythms, again, this is not a um, this is not uh, an ensemble rhythmic piece. It's not designed to have specific instruments layered into, into this particular rhythm. It's an implied rhythm that can be supported by, by the rhythms, but it's not an essential ensemble of, of rhythmic instruments. So once again, with a little bit more inflection, here is the rhythm uh, that, is, that is recommended for the mapale. stroke guide down at the bottom of open uh, sounds, uh, various, various stroke, uh, hand stroke on the drums, which gives it the result of the inflection. So we're going to listen to a piece of, uh, from Colombia entitled Prende la Vela, again sung by uh, El Café Coral. <clears throat> With that rhythmic cell and with that inflection. <laughs> in our study, this, show, this piece shows up in our study of analysis by a conductor. Sometimes the rhythm itself doesn't show up until later in the arrangement, as in this case. Here's an introduction. <laughs>
Merengue is a very interesting rhythm because we don't think of rhythms being socially engineered, but in the case of this rhythm, um, this, this rhythm was selected by a very despotic leader who engineered this rhythm, selected the rhythm from the countryside, brought it into the fabric of the people, and created a national rhythm to distinguish the Dominican Republic generally, specifically, uh, in opposition to Haiti, which shares the same island. So here we have a, a rhythm which, yes, had indigenous roots, but it was taken and, and, and uh, engineered into the fabric of society for the purpose of this, uh, personal identity, cultural identity. So the history is, is laid out here in, a, in, a, in an essay, but the skeleton, this is, a, this is one of those hot rhythms. <laughs> and uh, the, the uh, skeleton of this rhythm, it's played in, intentionally to be not heavily inflected, simply to lay out the, in, a, in a sort of plain, generic way uh, what the rhythm is, where, where the rhythm fits on the timeline. Traditional instruments, accordion, wira. Now the wira is the metal form of the scraper, where wira is the wooden form of the scraper. So there is a, that distinction. Uh, tambora, marimbula, which is like a big box with, with a uh, pitched to, to metal thumb, uh, uh, what do you call it? Like vibrating pieces of metal inside a, a big wooden box that sets pitch as a bass instrument. Um, brass, winds, piano. But the practical substitutes, which may be more useful to us, are timbales, congas, djembe, the things we have probably around us in our, in our regular program. Now here is an ensemble piece. So an ensemble piece would be, if you want to perform this, you, you, you say player one, take this home and learn this. Do some work, that's doable. Player two, Take this home. And they're both vying for a part two. As an ensemble, when you put them together, now you get the essence of the merengue.
a tool, a person that can help us sort of parse through uh, what seems to be complicated, but it's not nearly as complicated as we might assume uh, without some encouragement like today.